Hi, my name is Abby Pfeiffer and I'm a senior project manager at Voluble Insights, a company that specializes in using social media and other online data in complex commercial litigation. This is the third video in a three-part series covering broad use cases where litigants can rely on social media data as evidence to support their case. This video provides a look at issues related to defamation. I will discuss the way social media and traditional media fit into basic elements of defamation lawsuits, how social media can illustrate the spread, impact, and harm of defamatory statements, and three example social media analyses. The previous two videos in the series discuss deceptive advertising and intellectual property applications, and you can visit the Voluble website to view these and other videos. Social media data, meaning information drawn from activity on social networks such as Twitter and Facebook, offer a voluminous and organic source of contemporaneous consumer opinion. Over 80% of Americans use social media, and it increasingly is the arena in which ideas originate and spread. It is a reliable source of real-time information about the views and opinions of a broad set of American consumers. When used in litigation, social media can provide a robust set of evidence itself or be a compelling companion to a survey. Social media data can reinforce the results of a survey by offering insight into the conversations consumers were having at the time the event of interest occurred. You most likely have heard the terms libel and slander. Libel is written defamation, which includes any statement that is recorded or published in some way on radio, television, or the internet. And slander is spoken defamation, a statement that was said aloud to another person, but not necessarily recorded. Although the specifics differ from state to state, broadly speaking, defamation lawsuits require a statement to have been made and published, for it to be a false statement of fact about the plaintiff, and for it to have caused harm to the plaintiff. In some cases, it may also be necessary to establish actual malice on the part of the defendant rather than just negligence. We are always prepared to identify and collect evidence to support or refute the assertion of actual malice given the expansion of situations in which that standard must be met. Social media evidence can help to quantify how defamatory statements spread online when posted by the defendant or by third parties who share and repeat the defamatory content. It can also show the impact of defamatory statements, or a lack of impact, by analyzing the expressed beliefs and opinions about the plaintiff following the defamatory statements. Voluble can use social media to provide support at any point along the litigation process, from helping to collect data for the complaint, to identifying and working with a testifying expert to present online evidence related to the specific statements into the record and to interpret their impact. Social media can be particularly valuable in cases where the defamation was published on social networks. Courts have found that social media posts are more than just statements of opinion, and indeed can be considered statements of fact that can be shown to be demonstrably false and to cause harm. In this opinion, Eros versus Mangrove Partners, the court acknowledged that not only is online commentary capable of inflicting harm, but that online messages can spread more quickly to a broader audience. For example, in the matter of music producer Lucas Gottwald, also known as Dr. Luke, versus attorney Mark Garagos, the at issue defamatory statements were tweets about Dr. Luke published by Mr. Garagos. Thus, the actual defamation was initiated online through social media. In cases such as these, quantifying the spread of a defamatory statement and analyzing the direct response by the public can help establish harm to the plaintiff. Generally speaking, the more times a defamatory statement is viewed, the greater the number of impressions and the greater the scope of potential impact of that statement on the reputation of the defamed party. Social media may play a role even when the defamatory statement is made in a more traditional venue. An at-issue statement may first appear in TV or radio or in newspapers and then spread to online platforms, increasing the number of people who are exposed to the defamatory statement. For example, Fox News' defamatory broadcasts about Dominion voting systems first appeared on the cable news network, but later were posted on Fox News' accounts on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where they were additionally viewed tens of millions of times and then further shared by third parties. Social media is often a complement to traditional media. Former L columnist E. Jean Carroll's recent civil suit against former President Donald Trump alleged that he defamed her in posts on the social media platform Truth Social. In that case, Voluble helped to identify instances where President Trump's at-issue statements appeared on other social media platforms, in traditional media such as TV and print news, and on websites. 
We were then able to quantify the extent of the spread of his statements across media by estimating the number of impressions, which then became an input for the calculation of damages related to a reputational repair campaign. An additional point to keep in mind is that academic research finds that sensational and negative information is very impactful. Social media networks magnify the impact of negative information because particular posts can be seen by millions and spark a broader and long-lasting conversation. Negative and sensational information spreads further and faster than other types of information, especially on social networks. It is more likely to be remembered and is more enduring or stickier, which is important especially in instances where a first impression is being made. Within this context, it's clear why analyzing social media can be so important in defamation cases. Once defamatory information is posted online, it can quickly spread to a large audience, either generating negative first impressions or building negative associations with the defamed party. Because negative information is sticky and enduring, repairing the reputation of an individual or company can be very challenging. Of course, defamation lawsuits also require evidence of harm. An analysis of social media offers several ways to measure how the defamatory information was received by the public and can provide insight into whether and to what extent beliefs about a plaintiff changed after a defamatory statement. Changes to the public sentiment about the plaintiff can be thought of as harm to the reputation and brand identity of the plaintiff. This sort of reputational harm can occur alone or alongside other forms of harm such as lost business. Next, I will walk through some analyses of aggregated social media data as applied to a few hypothetical defamation cases. The examples that follow are based on approaches we have taken in real projects, but they themselves are purely hypothetical examples with mocked up data and graphs for illustrative purposes. Social media data, when aggregated, provides us a clear picture of the volume of discussion over time. Changes in the volume of conversation can be a first step to showing how defamation impacted the plaintiff's brand or reputation. In this example, the plaintiff was catapulted into the public eye by the ad issue defamatory statement. The graph shows the volume of conversations over time that mention the plaintiff by name. Prior to the defamatory statement, there was minimal organic consumer conversation about the plaintiff. After the alleged defamatory statement was published, there was a significant increase in the overall consumer discussion of the plaintiff. This sort of analysis can be used for either plaintiff or defendant side work. In this case, a clear impact is visible in the analysis, while in other cases, a notable lack of change in post volume may suggest that there was no impact on the plaintiff's brand from the defendant's statement. Just because more people are talking about a brand is not by itself evidence of harm. We need to look at the content of the conversations to understand whether the defamation impacted the sentiment or associations that consumers have of the plaintiff. In this example, brand A was already a topic of consumer conversation when the alleged defamation occurred. Using a combination of automated and manual review, we dug into the topics within posts about the plaintiff before and after the defamatory statement was made. As can be seen in the graph, virtually no online conversation about the plaintiff included the negative content that was the subject of the defamatory statement prior to the statement being made. Afterward is a different story. Immediately after the alleged defamatory statement was made, a significant portion of the post discussing the plaintiff included the defamatory claims or topics directly related to the ad issue statement. In this case, the data clearly support the expert's conclusion that the brand's image was damaged by the negative information. New and negative associations were made between the plaintiff and the false and defamatory information. In some instances, the defamatory claims may have been spread by multiple parties. In those cases, Social media can help to provide evidence tying the defendant to a specific and substantial portion of the spread of the defamatory information and the subsequent altered brand associations. One approach is to look at the future activity of users who interacted directly with the at issue social media post, the treatment group, to see if their posting behavior following that interaction was different from that of a control group. In this way, social media data allows us to design a quasi experiment which is one of the key tools social scientists use to observe and classify causality in the real world. In this fictitious example, the defamatory post was liked, shared, and commented on by several thousand users. These users are our treatment group. We examine the subsequent posts of the treatment group to determine if they were more or less likely than the control group, those who did not interact with the ad issue statement, to go on to post content repeating the defamatory information about the plaintiff. We found that some two-thirds of the users who interacted with the ad issue statement and then posted about the plaintiff 
repeated the defamatory content. In contrast, only one quarter of the control group repeated the defamatory claims in their posts about the plaintiff. This analysis illustrates that the defendant's statement was a key driver of a broader conversation on social media that established new and negative associations between the plaintiff and the defamatory claims. When it comes to defamation cases, whether the at-issue statements initially appeared online or in another venue, social media analysis can play a huge role. Negative and sensational information spreads rapidly and can quickly reach millions of consumers on social media. Voluble's analysis of social and online media can combine with other evidence such as a consumer survey to provide compelling and converging evidence of the magnitude of the spread, impact, and resultant harm from defamation. Voluble works with attorneys and experts to explore the data and design a robust set of analyses tailored to each case. We can get involved even before a complaint is filed. Contact us if you have a specific case you're wondering about or if you have general questions about our approach and capabilities. Our team would be happy to provide a free consultation.